Mr. Galloway, whenever you're ready. This is Joe Galloway conducting an oral history interview with Mr. Ed Woods on Wednesday, March 25th at 1500 hours. We're located in the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Sir, before we talk about your experiences in Vietnam, I'd like to get a little biographic information about you. How old were you when you went to Vietnam? First tour, I was 23. Second tour, I was 25. Uh, who were your family members? Were you married? I was married to uh, Carol Woods, my wife. We'd been married six, seven months uh, somewhere. We, we married in April, 65. Yeah. What was your hometown? Atlanta, born right here. Born right here. What was your sense of the Vietnam War before you decided to enlist in the military? I really didn't have any feelings. I, I was going to Tech at the time, Georgia Tech at the time, working at the time, working 40 hours, going to school at night. And uh, wasn't, I was drafted, got a draft notice. And uh, in December, November, December 63, got a draft notice. I said, I don't want to go in the Army. So I went on, on campus. They had a uh, Marine Corps Navy recruiting center. So I joined the Navy and uh, went, on, went on duty, went reserve duty in January 64. And uh, so I had very little emotion about the war because I, I, I'm, I'm not going to be in I'm in the Navy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be that. That bother me. And, and about that time, uh, leading up to that, that was when uh, Kennedy was killed, and they had the Cuban crisis. You know, uh, it was just Vietnam was not a part of what I. In fact, the very first time I ever heard about Vietnam was uh, I was a member of the uh, JCs in Atlanta, and we had a speaker come and they had just returned from Vietnam and was telling us about it. She said, you know, it's not a real problem over there. They can't shoot straight. Nobody, nobody is really interested in it right now. And that was, that was the first I'd heard. Uh, you were enlisted. I, I, I did enlist because to avoid the draft. Where, where did you, uh, where'd you do basic training? Great Lakes Naval Station. <clears throat> Describe the training that you received before you went to Vietnam. Uh, I, I went to a school in Davisville, Rhode Island. Went up there for three months, and that a school is merely a, a Navy uh, school that teaches you your rate. I was a builder, and they they teach you how to construct, and it's apprenticeship type program. Okay. Uh, when I left there, we came back through Atlanta. And I went to uh, Port Wyoming, California. Uh, my battalion, which was uh, Naval Mobile Construction Battalion 10, uh, was getting ready to mount out and go back to Vietnam on their second tour. They, they'd already been there one time. And they was getting ready to mount out. And they told me and probably a half a dozen other guys, you're going. And then all of a sudden, they discovered I had had not any combat training, which I hadn't. So they kept me and the other guys back about two weeks, and basically the combat training that I had in that short period of time was on the firing range. Uh, you know, learning that we had M14s, and so that's what we were shooting, you know. And other than that, I thought, and even on my second tour, my opinion is I thought that the Navy or the CVs was very negligent in their training. We we did a lot of other stuff, but I don't think it was for what we expected to encounter in Vietnam. Now, when you were finally sent to the battalion in Vietnam, uh, what date was that first tour? Uh, around the uh, first, around between the first and the fifteenth of Ju June, sixty-six. Sixty-six. Uh huh. What were your first impressions on landing in Vietnam? <laughs> <laughs> that, that was that was an experience. What it, what I we did we took uh, as the catch up guys we took a prop plane and we island hopped all the way over to Vietnam, 
And uh, when we pulled into Da Nang, when we flew into Da Nang, we was going in at night, and we could look out the window, and there was a big firefight going right on under us. You know, now you're, you're talking about kids that just got off a of firing range, and this was a big deal. And uh, so we saw a firefight, you know, and we landed. And God, was it hot, you know? It was hot as it could be. They met us uh, at the airport uh, with what I would call a cattle car, you know, today. You know, it was just a, a tractor trailer pulling, you know, a trailer and piled all of us in there. And we left there and went to uh, our, our battalion camp, which was Camp uh, Hoover at the time, and uh, which was really probably not more than two or three miles from the airport. It was just west of the airport. They couldn't the even afford a school bus, huh? No, they didn't have a bus. They piled us in this thing, and it felt like it was, it felt like 120 degrees, but it wasn't. It was at night, and it was just so humid. Smelled, it stunk. <laughs> I said, what have I got myself into? I just want the Navy, you know? <laughs> what were your initial duties? Uh, when I first got there for a couple of days, we filled sandbags. Yeah. And that's, that's you know, what, what the young enlistees did. We filled sandbags. I was uh, E3 at the time. And um, then after I did that, I still had not been assigned to a construction company, to a company. And uh, uh, they put us in to uh, put me and some of the other guys had their own duties, which I'm sure you remember around the 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 heads and so forth. Oh, and burning I, the... Yeah, burning the stuff. Uh -huh. Yeah. And... Uh, but I was fortunate. I was assigned to a guard guard duty. Yeah. I had I had some college. Now you got to remember that. So <laughs> a lot of good it was going to do you. <laughs> so I, I was assigned to a guard guard one of the. In fact, it was the southwest corner of the camp, and I did that for about six weeks, and then they four to six weeks, and they broke me free from that and assigned me to a regular construction company, which I stayed with for the rest of my tour. What what was your daily routine once you were with the Once I was signed, we, we would leave camp about 6 o'clock in the morning because the camp was already, that camp we were assigned to was already built and secured. And uh, we would go out daily, either south towards Chulai or west or even a little north towards Fu Wei Fu Bai, uh, to any marine outpost that needed some construction work going on. and. Uh, uh, we wouldn't go out as a full company. We'd go out in small details, and uh, you know, we 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 happened up on a marine camp. Little marine camp was probably wasn't a lot bigger in this room. It was just a little small detail, and and we woke them up. But our day would start about six o'clock in the morning, and we'd arrive back at our base camp at six o'clock in the evening. You know, and shower and get something to eat, watch a little bit of movie, or go to the EM club if you could, and. That was about it, you know. It, I'm sorry, go ahead. What were your living conditions like on the base? Uh, as a CB, we took care of ourselves, okay? <laughs> uh, my living my living quarters was, we, we had fine. It was a, in a 16 by 32, and uh, I can still build one of those. I, you know, I've gone to sleep at night building 16 by 32s. I know how to do those. <laughs> There's no telling how many I did those. Uh, but that our living quarter, like I say, was nice. We we did have a head down the road, and we not very far from the from the galley. You know, everything was. I ha I have to say, for what I had versus what I saw some other guys have, I had it made. Chow pretty good. Uh, I ate a lot of things I've, I've never eaten before, and I hadn't eaten since. And, uh, uh, but you know, the the cooks were good, and uh, I won't drink Kool Aid anymore. <laughs> I had enough. I don't know how many flavors of Kool Aid they had, but uh, I, you know, I don't drink that anymore. <laughs> don't drink Seagrams anymore either. What responsibilities consume most of your time? Uh, not not long after I was there, I made E4, third class petty officer, and uh, so you know I had I had two or three guys on occasion work for me. We one of my one of my duties was to build a uh, we had to build a morgue, and um, so but we had the morgue the road had to cross a small creek, 
so we had to build a culvert to water to run on to, so you can drive over that. Uh, that was a, about a week long duty to, to build that and then we had to build a morgue or we had to, um, uh, on one occasion, uh, for about two weeks we worked at the uh, Marine Air Base in denying building uh, what we called revetments, which was uh, protection for the normal guy. It was protection between planes. They, they parked the planes in. These things were normally about eight foot tall, not made out of steel. Uh, and sometimes they get blown up, we'd go back in. But if, if, you, if you had a plane over here and you had a revetment, you had a plane over here, this plane got hit with a mortar, it wouldn't affect this one. Or, and, and they also parked helicopters between them. But we did that quite a bit, or we did the parking aprons for the planes. Most, most of what we did was, was for Marines of some kind. What were your impressions of the Vietnamese people? Honestly, I tried to, I didn't try to, I didn't try to be friends, okay? I, and, and, and I had heard so many stories uh, about the children. The children were beautiful. The children were just good, good kids. They were caught up in this mess. But I'd heard stories of, of soldiers and Marines getting killed by these people wearing, you know, vests. And, and and so I, I, I shied away from that. That little blonde back there sort of wanted me to come back home, and uh, that's what I was going to do. Describe your friendships with and your impressions of uh, fellow sailors and Marines, people you I wasn't were with around. no sailors. I wasn't. I was, you didn't see no sailors. I didn't see no sailors. Never been on a ship in my life, okay? <laughs> but, so it was Marines all the way. The Marines, uh, uh, we had, the Marines, I think, probably thought more of us than we actually thought of them at the time, at the time. Because whatever they wanted, they were able to get, procure from us. Comshaw was a good word back then. Uh, we were able to, they had things that we couldn't get, so we would swap out wood for, for whatever. The Marines were just, I thought a couple of them I ran into were a little crazy, but that was, they were Marines. And, and you know, <laughs> I, I, I can't say a lot else. They were just, I was glad they were there. Did you form friendships with men from different racial and social backgrounds during your time in Vietnam? that you might not have had in civilian life? Well, no, not really. Uh, in, in the CBs, I would say it was probably 90% white, okay? Uh, there were very few blacks. Uh, I don't know why. It was just that was the way it was, and, and everybody mixed well. There wasn't no issues. There were, I never saw anything. and. And I, I was born, like I said, I was born right here in Atlanta. And I have to also say, what I'm about to say may be inappropriate, but I was born on the south side of Atlanta, right in the middle of a racially mixed neighborhood. I never had issues. It was never anything that concerned me. Hmm. Never did. It was just, that was the way it was. And I still keep in touch with uh, the three guys that I was, in the, in the CBs with, I still keep in touch with them daily, either through emails or Facebook or some social. What what did you do for recreation off-duty activities if you had any off-duty time? <laughs> we we uh, Sunday afternoon was a uh, half a day work, and then uh, we would uh, they would cook steaks, grill steaks, or whatever, and if you could figure out a way, you'd get yourself a couple of steaks because I didn't weigh but 135 pounds at the time, and, and we were hard, you know. We we could we could eat some food. Uh, on occasion, uh, maybe three times that I was in denying, uh, I went to uh, China Beach. Mm. On the after Sunday afternoon, they take a bus load, truck load, to China Beach, get in a deuce and a half, go to China Beach. Now, when I was on my second tour, there was no, 
uh, where I was on my second tour, there was no, no recreation whatsoever. None. Didn't even have a. Uh, didn't even get to see a movie. Didn't get where, to go to the. Where Yen were Club. you located on your second tour? On my second tour, I was located at a camp called Camp Carroll, which was north. It was north. It was on Highway uh, Nine, uh, halfway between Contien and Quezon. Uh, uh, I could go out of my hut, or we could sit on a pile of wood at night, and uh, we could see North Vietnam. Of course, you see the DMZ without a problem, uh, and that was in October, November of '67. And uh, Contien was just being blasted all to pieces, and so we we observed. You could see that at night, and and there was nothing. I mean, Camp Carroll was an artillery base. It was headquarters for the Third Marine Regiment. And uh, in the center of it was an artillery encampment, and the Army had the 175s there, and the Marines had the 155s and the 105s, and they were constantly firing. We were too close for Contien to fire support for them. Uh, so Quezon would fire over us support to support Contien. And, and it's interesting, not every round goes where it's supposed to go. That's true. And. And we did get short round, <laughs> short round fall on us, but uh, we, it, that was not a secure area. None of that area was secure, so there was no movies, no no going to the beach. Do you have any specific memories of the popular culture, music, books, films from your time in Nam? Well. In the last uh, five years, I started. I actually started in '09. It'd be six years now. I started writing my memoirs, and not for purpose of publication, but for my family purpose. I did did the genealogy and doing memoirs, and that brought back an awful lot. I searched and searched, and and uh, I, I know it annoys my wife, but I spent a lot of time doing that. And, and the memories that I have from Vietnam was mostly music. Okay, mostly music and uh, the Stones and the Animals and the Beatles were big. You know, all of that was going on. And uh, one of my high school classmates was Tommy Rowe, who was big in the '60s. And uh, so, you know, music and 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 I've geared everything. If, if I hear a song, we got to get out of this. Got to get out of this place. You know, <laughs> walk through the jungle. You know, and all, all this stuff going on. You know, and and uh, but. I associate music, and, and, and then when I got back and back home in '68, then of course you, you remember the movies and stuff. But that wasn't Vietnam to me because I wasn't I was home now. I'm through. Yeah, you know. And, you and thought that's, that's unfortunate. That's very unfortunate that I felt that way. But that was I was done. Did you uh, did you volunteer for your second tour? Oh no. No, <laughs> so I uh, battalions were very much like uh, to put it in in terms where people can understand. Battalions were like <clears throat> navy ships; they would go out and come back. We went out for nine months and we came back for six months. Out for nine, come back for six. Uh, when I went back to Vietnam in uh, September of '67. I had gotten home in February of '67, and then went back in September. Uh, we had a, a layover, a short layover in Okinawa, and then we went on into Vietnam. But uh, uh, that was my battalion's third trip to Vietnam. They were the very first battalion to go in in May of '65. So, in in their whole tour of duty was, they did five tours. They were the only battalion to do five tours in Vietnam. But no, to answer your question, I, I had no choice in the matter. Uh, in fact, we were one one night. I got a call into the my chief's office or whatever I can't recall, and he he said, uh, "Woods." I said, "Yes, sir." What did I do wrong? You know, he said you didn't do anything wrong. He said, uh, "We want to promote you to E5, second class." I said, "Okay, what's the catch?" <laughs> and uh, 
He said, well, you've got to stay another year on active duty. I said, let me see if I get this straight. And this is pretty well way I, I said, you're fixing to go to Quezon, and I'm fixing to go to Atlanta. And as soon as I go to Atlanta and get back to the reserve unit, I get my E-5. He said, yeah. I said, I, I'm, I'm staying. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go home. I, my time's up. My second tour, I don't need to see any more of this. And I, I left I left there uh, December the 9th, 1967, and I exited active duty on December the 23rd. Here's after the second tour. After the second tour, yeah. <clears throat> Can you describe significant ac actions you witnessed or participated in? The, the, the biggest actions in, in was in, on my second, on my first tour. I was in denying, so the area was fairly secure. But I do remember one day I went to a um, medevac center. Uh, some people call it in the army call them mass units or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, I was there, and I can't. I don't remember why I was there. I don't. I don't remember if I was working or if if I uh, was there for personal injury myself which generally was me hitting myself on the thumb with a hammer. <laughs> but uh, uh, I do remember helicopters coming in, and they had the, the outriggers on them for, for cots or whatever, and they were full of body bags. And I, and I remember that, and I remember standing there and looking at this coming in, and they needed help unloading the body bags at this center, you know, I, and, and, I, and I got into that. Other than that, I, that was that to me was bad enough. And then watching the constant battle of of Contien, that was just constant, constant, constant. Uh, that's as far as me in anything other than getting shot at every once in a while. No. What's your most vivid memory of your time in Vietnam, either tour? I got out on December the 9th. I, I left Vietnam to come home. On December the 6th, we got mortar rounds. And this is one of those eye moments, okay? Uh, we got, uh, I remember one night, we we had a uh, excuse me. We had a uh, between us and Contien, we had a B-52 raid. Now we you got to imagine we weren't but three miles from Contien, and had a B-52 raid between us. That's a rude awakening at three o'clock in the morning. And and uh, you know we we had seen B-52 raids pretty well during the day. But I mean, you everything in your hooch is bouncing all over the place, and you we immediately jumped in there. We had we had mortar trenches beside each hooch, and, and we, the same thing happened when we got short rounds. We had to go into those. Uh, you know, you, you you see a lot, and I didn't, but I didn't see as much as an awful lot of other people did. Describe for me the best day you had in Vietnam. Oh, I went to China Beach. <laughs> that that was the best day I ever had. You know, we we got out there, we cooked steaks on at the beach. You know, and and uh, unfortunately, uh, excuse me, there was no ladies. <laughs> so you know, you're just a bunch of guys. You know, and you see helicopters flying over, and it, it was a well protected area. But it was we got to go to China Beach. You know, we actually got to live like human beings for a change and. And uh, oh, and I did see Bob Hope, so I got to see Bob Hope show at, at Freedom Hill in Denying. Yeah. Describe for me the worst day you had during your tour or tours. Um, actually, my worst day was going back from my second tour. Uh, and and. and we, we we landed at a place that I can't pronounce, Gile or something like that, which is just it's in the in, in the Waifu Bay area. We landed there, and we left there and went uh, by a caravan to to Camp Carroll, and you know you're just going through 
the elephant grass through all this other mess. The, the smell is the same as it was that you remembered when you left. Uh, no, I, that, that had to be my worst day. If I got through that, then I'd have been fine. You know, they just. How much contact did you have with our allies? By that, I mean the Koreans, the uh, Thais, the Aussies, any of those? None. None. Zero. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. Oh, do you have any contact with our uh, Arvin allies? No, sir. I saw them, but we had no contact with them. No contact. No. How much contact did you have with your wife and family back home? Interesting story. Uh, when I was working guard duty in my first two or three weeks I was there, I got to know the guy running the station the, where they bounce you back and forth. You know, to, He was running the radio shift at night and um, me and him got to be friends. Was close. I never saw him. Never saw him. Don't know what he looked like today. Uh, but we talked a lot on the radio and uh, telephone and he, he, we commented that, can you get me to my wife? You know, she was in California. When we, when we left Atlanta, both of us went to California, not knowing I was immediately going to Vietnam. So I had to leave her in California, and, uh, and she had gone to work for uh, Bank of America at the time. And so he patched me right into her at the bank. It was like, I think, a 12-hour time delay, so it, the timing was absolutely correct. He patched me right into her, and, and he did tell me, he said, now, Ed, if we get hit, you got to go. It's off. And, and I swear, I, I feels like I, I talked to her forever, but it was, it was only two or three minutes, I'm sure, and and we got hit. Sure enough, we did take some mortar rounds, and, uh, but that was the only time in 15 months I was in country that I ever got to talk to her. Yeah. Uh. <coughs> How much news did you receive about the war from home? We read Stars and Stripes, and um, and that was pretty well it. You know, uh, Hanoi, Hanno, whatever her name was, you know, she'd tell you all that was going on. But uh, uh, we didn't. I didn't. I didn't really receive any newspapers to speak of. Every once in a while. Carol would send me a newspaper or something, but I can't remember any stories in it that was of negative. It didn't affect you one way or it another. It didn't affect me at all, quite honestly. Were you aware of any particular political, social events, or movements back home? Uh, no. Now, when I when I came home between tours, Carol and I, we were in Port Wyoming, and we flew up to San Francisco for a weekend. And we got involved up there by happenstance uh, at one of the local college campuses sit in. We were just walking around looking at it, you know, and we stayed there for a little bit and walked away, you know, and it was, I, I didn't, I wasn't a political junkie at the time and, and uh, uh, really didn't know a lot about, I, I was, I, I think I was more in tune to what was going on than a lot of young people are today about what's going on, and but uh, I really I, I I didn't. We all had S's on our chest, okay? There was nothing going to happen to us, and so it didn't bother us. Uh, what was your return home like at the end of <laughs> your last tour? Other than. Other than hitting myself with a hammer or cutting myself with a saw, I had no injuries, okay? Carol met me at Norton Air Force Base. I flew back on private carrier, uh, Continental Airlines. I'll never forget it. I was one of the last ones to get on board. And I said, have you got enough room on there for me, you know? Because they had us lined up, Army, Navy, Marines, whatever, you know. It didn't make it difference what you were, but you were lined up. Oh, we'll get you on. And uh, so I rode in first class all the way back in the first class seats. It was nice. And Carol met me at Norton Air Force Base, had everything packed, and we left from there and drove back home. And the uh, only reason I didn't have any injuries in Vietnam that night we had a little carafe of champagne and I'm sitting there in the bed holding two 
champagne glasses, and she threw the craft over to me and broke. I, but what am I going to do, you know? I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting there. I got cut. <laughs> you know, I'm back home, and I'm, I'm cut and bleeding here, you know. But it, it, it was good. Coming back to the South, the South was, I don't know what's a good word for it. We just, people back here were just a different breed of people that didn't, they didn't get involved with the political issues of that. They had other political issues. Vietnam was not high on their list. What was your reception like from family and friends? Uh, I really can't remember. I, I just remember her real well. And Mama was glad, you know, certainly glad I was back home. And because uh, unknowing to me and my wife, Mother had written to uh, uh, Herman Talmadge, like Herman and Russell, whatever the senators, who Richard wanted, Russell, Richard Russell, and and asked not to send me back. And of course, that was no, you know, that wasn't going to happen, you know. So, <laughs> and we didn't know that. We actually did not know that until Mother passed, and we got all of her papers, and we found the letters hmm. that she had done that. And uh, but. Uh, you know, it was, it, 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 we didn't throw a party, you know, we just, I was just, I, I, I grew up in a lot of poverty. There was nothing, you know, there was not a lot of money you could spend either before I went to Vietnam or when I came back from Vietnam. So we, we just had dinner, you know, and that's the best I can remember. Got you got know. back to life. Back to life, you know. How much contact have you had with fellow veterans over the years, if any? Well, actually, uh, uh, I didn't for a while. Did have, in fact, I went to work uh, in night and in, in the summer of '68, I went to work for Ford Motor Company and stayed there for 31 years. And I doubt very seriously if more than a dozen people ever knew I was in Vietnam. There's just something we didn't talk about. Uh, unbeknownst to me, that I didn't think about, uh, my best friend here in Atlanta uh, was a. Uh, uh, a 104 Air Force pilot, and he was in Vietnam in 68. So after Carol and I moved to Virginia, we lived up there for 12 years, and we moved back here in 05. And after that, then I got back with him, and I joined the AVVBA. He got me into that. So I've, 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 I stay in touch with a lot of Vietnam veterans, and I stay in touch with uh, uh, three uh, that I was in country with through social media. Uh, I'm also in social media I'm with, uh, I see a lot of what's going on on Facebook with the, with the different uh, Vietnam veterans groups in Facebook. I have not joined a VFW. I don't know that that is, is me, you know. But I, the AVVBA is one of the best organizations I've ever, as far as how they handle and react with the outside world, so to speak. Yeah. Was it difficult readjusting to life, civilian life, after the war? Uh, no, not really, not at the time. And um, you, you, I, I wasn't any in any jungle fight, so to speak. Okay, I wasn't in. You, I'm gonna kill you. You're gonna kill me. Type fights and. and so my life, I came back and I went to my old job and I stayed there for six months and then I, I was able to get a uh, an engineering job with Ford Motor Company and, and I progressed fairly rapidly through the company. And um, I, I didn't have time for all this other stuff. We Our work was, working in the automotive industry is just, you ain't got time for anything. That's what you do. And, uh, uh, I really didn't, I didn't give it a lot of thought. How did your experience in Vietnam affect the way you think about Viet veterans returning from combat today? When, when we moved to Virginia, we were stationed, stationed, <laughs> I was working, <laughs> I'm sorry, we, we was working at the Norfolk, Ford assembly plant. So I was, we were with Navy all the time there. 
and Carol and I would make comments and when they bring the uh, carrier groups in, the carrier groups were staying out six months and coming back, you know. I said, you know, these guys are ridiculous, you know, staying out six months and they got internet, they got cell phones, they got all that. And here I am talking and, and yet the guys in World War II didn't and Korea didn't have what we had, okay? Right. So it, it, it progressed, it's progressed. And, and I, finally, I finally accepted the fact that this is the way it's supposed to be. You know, these guys, and, and we've done a lot of work with our organization to help the Iraqi and the Afghanistan veterans. And uh, I'm all for what they're doing. It's, uh, you know, they're coming home, they're having issues. Those issues need to be corrected and taken care of. And I think they're being handled. I just wish the VA would be I wish the VA could could do more. I don't know of a better way to say it. Yeah. How do you think the Vietnam conflict is remembered today in our society? I met a person about three or four years ago for the first time, and this person, through a conversation I had with her, uh, she the conversation came out that I was a Vietnam veteran. She said, well, you must be crazy. I said, well, you know, no, not necessarily, you know. I, I may be a little on the borderline, but, you know, I'm not completely crazy. Uh, but I think that that's what a lot of people think about Vietnam veterans, is that that we are, you know, either borderline crazy or crazy or whatever the case may be, that, you know, we had such a tough time and you have there's some guys that really did have a tough time, really did. And, um, but I think right now the, the political feeling right now towards Vietnam veterans is, and, and the public feeling as well, is changing and accepting us and graciously accepting us and for what we really did, for completely 180 degrees from what we had 50 years ago. In the end, what did that war mean to you and your generation? Had I not gone in the service, drafted or, or enlisted, whatever the case may be, uh, I don't think I would be the person I am right now. And that's not to say I'm a great person. I think that I learned a lot. Uh, I grew up. Uh, I saw I saw a situation where these men are willing to die for what other people have to say, and I, I don't know. I, I just I, I think it made me a better man, I, and I really feel that way. And I I've tried to we we've had we've got two daughters, and we now got a granddaughter and a grandson, and I've tried to stress my beliefs with my daughters. And you know, you can't go up to her and say, "Hey, you got to be a man." But you know, you, the point is, you got to take responsibility and be a person for what you are. And they did. They have. They turned out to be quite good girls. So, you know, it, 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 I, I have to take responsibility for everything I've done, and I think the military taught me that. What lessons did you take from Vietnam that you would like to pass on to future generations of Americans? I think fighting, I think I th I've got problems that in that, I think fighting a war for, I, I really don't know how to express myself, but let's see if I can. I, I think just because you can fight a war, you shouldn't fight a war, okay? I think war serves purpose, and wars create peace. You're not going to have peace without a war, in my opinion. Uh, I think you can look at Korea, North and South Korea right now. Uh, there's peace. Prior to that, there wasn't. In Vietnam, okay, we, we did not come out on the good side of that. But Vietnam is is doing rather well uh, financially, and and they 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 are a communist country, and and uh, 
it, it, but the other day I bought some shirts, say the other day, a year ago I bought some shirts and they were made in Vietnam, you know. But I, I, I don't know. I think that I'm not, I'm not I'm, I'm politically active right now, but I'm also to a point that I think some of the things that are going on right now politically are disturbing to me. And, you know, we need to, the old expression, either whatever and get off or get off the pot, one or the other, you know? Have you been to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in D.C.? Many times. I go, uh, I go, I got two friends on there. Uh, one was my uh, crew leader, and uh, another one was an uh, interesting story. Is He was in my reserve, reserve unit here in Atlanta, and when we went on active duty at the same time, he was assigned to another battalion, MCB-4, I think, and we went through nine months of Vietnam, not an injury, not nothing. He's there. We leave in February. He comes in in March. He's killed. Uh, he runs over same same road that I rode over many times. They, they hit a mine, and three three CBs were killed at the time. So I know Larry's there, and, and I know Bob's there, and uh, and I know there's a lot of guys that I saw that are there. And, uh, but I go to the uh, roving wall, the miniature wall. We we do that. And Carol and I have been to the Washington on many occasions. Have you heard about the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War Commemoration Project? Uh, actually, uh, yes. In fact, uh, a couple of weeks ago we were at the National Cemetery. Carol and I went to the National Cemetery here in Atlanta, which is not very far from where we live, and uh, participated in a commemorative event there to knock it off. You know, and. Uh, so yeah, the, what are your thoughts about this effort? Hey, I'm I'm all for it. You know, I think that it, it, it lets people know. I go to the state capitol every chance I get when we have things down there, and we're fixing Monday the thirtieth. Yeah, we're doing a Vietnam kickoff down there. Uh, Governor Deal and the state of Georgia have been gracious in recognizing Vietnam veterans, and uh, I don't know if he does that voluntarily or, or if it's strongly suggested to him that he does it, but he does it, and, and it works, and I'm happy. Thank you, Mr. Woods. No, thank you. I really mean that. Appreciate it. Appreciate Are your done? service. Yes, sir, we are. Thank you very much. That was great. No, I don't know. It was all that good. Not all. Uh, my deal on helicopters is that every time I hear a helicopter, and, and, and I have been diagnosed with PTSD, as, as most of the guys have, but anyway, is when I hear a helicopter, I, I know as, as, a, as a ground infantryman, he loves it, okay? Because the, they're coming to get him, or they're bringing in fresh troops, okay? Take him out, bring in fresh. Or where I visualized when I saw that helicopter land with those bodies, they're taking bodies out. Uh, helicopters bother me. I don't like, you know, I'm talking about the Hueys. I can tell the difference between the, those guys and the, and the gunships and than, than the traffic helicopters we have here. I know the difference. That bothers me. Other than that, uh, I've even flown in a helicopter. I went to Hawaii and I flew in a helicopter. It was a little bitty thing, but. Uh, the, the Hueys hearing that sound and knowing what they meant, but knowing what they meant to the guys on the ground more so. Oh, than I love them. Yeah, you love them, and, and but I visualize it as different. In, in 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 your book, that got you off the ground. That got you out of there. Yeah. See, I, I, took our wounded out. Took your took wound, our dead down. And and, and and you just like uh, the other day. We watched the Battle of uh, Docto and uh, what they did in Docto to, to carry the bodies out. You know, it was gruesome, horrifying, and 
that's my vision of it. I never rode one while I was in country. And I just see things, I see it different yeah. than you do. Yeah. Than the infantry guy does. The infantry guy, that was his blessing. To me, it wasn't. Cattle car is mine. Thank you.